Hi. Hi. <laughs> you look beautiful. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. So we have um, our a, a select few of our students. The, they had to be selected for this. So the first criteria was that they have um, a grade of at least an 80 or higher. So that's the first um, what we used to first select them. And then after that, we, you know, considered some other factors. So we have some students from middle school, we have a few students from high school, and then we have two students who are in college. Um, and they, you know, want to find out more about, you know, commercial dance, and they may have some questions for you as well. So um, if you're ready, we can just go ahead and start with your background and who you are and, you know, why this session is so um, important for the students. Okay, so I'll just share with you kind of journey, my story. Um, I was born in Orlando, Florida, and then moved to Ohio, Euclid, Ohio specifically. And um, I started dancing at three. So I don't have a memory of myself not being a dancer. I started off with ballet and with tap. And then around seven, I started doing acro gymnastics. So acro gymnastics is different than like the balance beam and the, you know, the floor exercise. It's a trampoline and it's a strip of mat. And you just do like a tumbling pass down the thing. And I say that because that's where I first started competing. So I competed in acro gymnastics. And it's also where you kind of like, where you see people, like they jump on top of people's shoulders and do like a handstand on each other's handstand. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I kind of learned like this um, fearlessness, I think, of approaching different things. It wasn't like the norm. I don't know why random Euclid happened to have acro gymnastics. I had never heard of it before. And um, so from there, we moved to Virginia, Western Virginia. And that's when I started doing more like different, I got exposed to different kinds of styles of dance. And that's when uh, the dance teacher, Chris Grogas, she was doing dance competitions. So I'd already competed in acro gymnastics, but never in dance. So I remember my first solo, I was nine. I did Imagine and, um, and dance competitions from 10 until about 16 years old. And that was kind of like my backdrop into being on stage was through the competition world. And from there, I... Um, became like when I got into high school, it started getting, you know, more specific and more competitive and that kind of idea. And you have to kind of, I had to start to reconcile this thing that I love to do, but we were competing for it. And that's all I kind of knew about. And that trained me to approach dance and understand when you go into the competition world, I'm going to stop right here just because it's in the vein of, of my journey of like my discovery of dance and myself in the competition you can't be focused on the opponent. It was like the moment that you started thinking about that, you weren't thinking about your own dance. And I started to realize that the thing about dance competitions is um, you are there to present your dance and then you're competing against other people presenting their dance, but you're not doing the same steps. And that's why I learned right then that dance, you have to focus completely on your own personal experience, your own personal feeling of the music. Like when you're in class, you can't be thinking about what other people are doing because you're focused off of your own growth. Right. And in dance competitions, they train you on to recognize it's about musicality, it's about your technique, it's about your performance. So all of that is encompassing in inside my kind of my training. Um, then we got to this point where my, my um, my dad's mom started to get sick and he wanted to move closer to be with her. And she was in Troy, Alabama. That means we had to leave Virginia. Now at the time I'm in my full scope dance competition world. I am junior varsity captain of the cheerleaders. I had just gotten chosen to be captain of the cheerleaders for the next year. This was my sophomore year. I'm getting ready to go into my junior year. And I was a wreck. Dance and all of that was like my whole bubble life. I didn't go to like sleepovers. I didn't do all that stuff. I was training four or five times a week. And um, so I said, okay, I'll go. Like I had a choice. Mm -hmm. I'll go mm -hmm. if you find me a performing arts dance school. Because growing up, fame was my world. That's the only time I was able to stay up late was to watch Debbie Allen on fame. 
<laughs> so they were like, okay. So we, we, my, um, my dad went down to Atlanta. He found two schools, Avondale and North Atlanta School of Performing Arts. So we went to visit both schools and they were both great. North Atlanta had this teacher named Gary Harrison. And when you go into the school, into the dance room, it had these stairs that led down to where then the dance room was on the bottom. So we're looking at the school and he starts cussing this girl out. I mean, he let her have it about how she wasn't doing the steps right and this or whatever. And my parents were like, oh God, this is it. What are we gonna do? We don't have any other choices. And they looked at me and I was like, this is it. This is where I wanna go. And they were like, what? And I was like, no, he, he cared so much. He cared like I felt I cared. I had this passion and this love for dance. And my dance teacher in Virginia that I was leaving, Terry Payton, she was a stickler for um, the counts and the specifics and the details. And if we were running a routine and one person messed up, she stopped it and started everything over again. Mm -hmm. So it was really about uh, understanding that it was about achieving this level of excellence, constantly pushing you, pushing you. And I knew for me to do what I wanted to do, I wanted to dance, that I was gonna need a teacher that was gonna push me, right? And to mm -hmm. really instill in me everything that I needed. So we moved to, to from Virginia to Atlanta and I still was doing the dance competitions. And I happened to go to a thing at the time, it was called um, a convention. And that's when all the dance teachers and choreographers from basically Los Angeles would come to different cities and they do like this little tour and you could take classes from them and they called it a convention. So I right. took classes and then at the end of them, they would have a mock audition. And if you made it to the end of the audition, it was, they would chose two people, then you got a chance to get a scholarship. So there was this one convention called Tremaine. They came through Atlanta. I went through, I got to the end and I ended up getting the scholarship. And the scholarship was to go to Los Angeles and train for a month with their, you know, with their staff and their teachers. So that's my, the end of my junior year. I got that. I mean, the end of my, um, going in, going into the, the junior year, I got that. So um, Gary, we had dance every day and we did ballet and then we had modern. And then he happened to have a dance company, a modern dance company called the Gary, Gary Harrison Company. And um, at the end of the school year, he, he, uh, we were at the concert and he looked at my mom and he said, she needs to be in here. She needs to stop doing the dance competitions. She needs to come in here. And so I was like, all right, that's it. We're gonna do that. And um, that was in between my um, junior and my senior year. And my junior year summer, I went to Los Angeles and I trained for a month with those teachers and it was every day, Monday through Saturday from 10 a.m. until 10 o'clock at night, just getting immersed in all different kinds of styles. There was this teacher, Marguerite um, Derricks, who, who she was the assistant choreographer for Debbie Allen and um, on Fame. And she had this class that nobody wanted to take because it was so hard. And so the goal was to have the courage to take her, if you could just get through her class, it was, it was saying a lot about how you felt about yourself as a dancer. So it was the goal was to always go to her class, not skip her class, get through her right. class. And um, so then I'm back in Atlanta and I'm senior year and I'm studying with, with Gary at school. And then as well, we're doing a, this dance company. We had the winter concert and the spring concert. And he had a guest choreographer named Jimmy Locust come through. Now, Jimmy had danced with Paul Abdul and Janet. It was very exciting. And he choreographed this modern number for our concert. And um, then I, I, um, I graduated and I decided I was gonna go to Spelman. And um, so I went to Spelman College. And at the time when I decided to go to school, I had this moment where all I knew of myself was, a, was being a dancer. I didn't really know myself as anything other. And I knew that I loved it, but I didn't know if there was anything else that I loved. Mm. So I was like, I'm going to go to school. And I knew I thought I would be like a doctor, maybe sports medicine, maybe work with a dance company, maybe, dance, you know, an ath athletic team. And I realized what I was actually dealing with was fear because I was in Atlanta. And at the time there was nothing. Atlanta is not like how it is now where people that go right. to Atlanta to like, yeah. you know, get their, mm -hmm. their whole life in, you know, their, their professional uh, artist career. Right. There was nothing. There wasn't a dance agency. There was just nothing. And so mm -hmm. I was like, there's nothing I can do here. 
So I went to school and um, the caveat was um, Spelman wasn't something that my, my family could afford. And my dad sat me down. He was like, listen, he didn't go to the school that he wanted to go to. My mom didn't go to the school that she wanted to go to. And so they're like, you've got some scholarships. Now you could have gone for free because of the Hope Scholarship mm -hmm. in Georgia allowed you to go to college, any college, a state school, and it was a full scholarship. He's like, you have chosen to not do that. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to get a job. And all of your money is going to go to us every week. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I don't really want to do that, but what can I do? And Jimmy Locust, the choreographer, called and said, Fawn, I've just been named the choreographer of the Atlanta Hawks dance mm -hmm. team, and I want you to come audition. And I was like, okay. And um, so I went and auditioned. I remember I was number 413 and I made it to the end and I was 17 at the time and you had to be 18. So Jimmy kind of fudged it a little bit and told them I was, I was gonna be 18. And mm -hmm. so I ended up getting it. So my, my freshman year at Spelman, I was um, on the Atlanta Hawks dance team and also a bio major, which became more challenging than I thought. So I ended up having, we got to like the semifinals. I was like, Jimmy, I can't do this. These labs are kicking my behind. I can't be, it was every single day. And I thought it was gonna be a part-time three, three days a week, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so now I'm just in school and we started doing these things called industrials and industrials are where like a school, like um, a company like Fila or Nike, Reebok, Adidas, they would do these uh, fashion shows, but instead of having a fashion show for their upcoming line of clothing, they would, they would do these little dance performances. So I started making money doing that in school and then we started doing this thing it's a company called total entertainment where we would come and perform at bat mitzvahs and corporate parties and doing all that kind of stuff so doing that in school and then i reached this point where i was like i am miserable i am not doing what i really want to do and i don't know how to do it and i had this moment i was at home in between semesters my junior year and um it was 9 30 at night and normally i wouldn't be there and my mom came in my room and she was like, Fawn, are you okay? Because you've been here all weekend and you're still here. And I just broke down crying. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I, 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 I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm miserable and I don't see a way out of this. I looked into like my future and it just looked dark. I didn't know what I could do or what I was gonna do. So she got my, my dad and we prayed for the first time as a family that God would do something for me. Mm -hmm. And three days later, I got a phone call from Jimmy saying, hey, Travis and Lavelle called and they want you to go on tour with Michael Jackson. <laughs> so my whole life changed in that moment. It was completely yeah. an intervention. And what had, happened, what had happened was three years prior, while I was um, an Atlanta Hawks dancer, Travis Payne and Lavelle Smith, who were the choreographers for Michael, also Janet, came and they choreographed a number on, the, on us, the dance team. And the number happened to be dangerous. And they remembered how I did the routine. Apparently they said they, it was a routine meant for guys. And I was a girl that executed it like a guy would. And um, they remembered me when it was time for a replacement to come up for Michael. One of the girls was leaving the tour, Seanette Heard. And she was going back to dance with Janet and they needed a, another black girl. Michael had one white girl, he had one black girl and they needed mm -hmm. a replacement. And out of all those people, that they had just worked with a hundred and something people in Los Angeles on a Michael video. They chose me in Atlanta where there was no outlet, no way for me to do any of that. I was, I, I was like, I don't have a car to get to, to be in LA. So the idea of this happening was so far fetched and out of the scope of anything, yeah. but it happened. So then I went on tour with Michael Jackson um, for about nine months. And then when I was done, Lavelle looked at me and he was like, so what are you gonna do? Are you gonna go? you know, what are you gonna do? <laughs> you're gonna continue, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I'm gonna go back to school, I guess. I'm gonna finish my degree, I'm gonna go back to school. And he was like, no, I think you should come to LA. And I, and I did. So one of the other dancers, Chris Judd at the time, said that I could stay with him and um, his girl at the time, Stacy. And if I decided to come to LA, and so I booked a one-way ticket. It was mm -hmm. January 19th, 1998, took mm -hmm. a one-way flight. I stayed with them. I stayed on their floor for a few weeks. 
And then I ended up getting my own place and I, I got a place for six months because my goal was to live in LA as a dancer and work for six months. Mm -hmm. And that was it. I, I was done. I, I'm like, I could do anything. I could work anywhere. I would be happy and fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And um, that process, I'm still there, you know? Um, and it, it, it worked out. I, I ended up working with, um, after Michael, I was there in, in, in LA and I started auditioning and I wasn't getting anything. And here I was, you know, I'm fresh off this tour and I'm thinking I'm going, you know, it's just going to pop, 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 pop. And, and it mm -hmm. did. And I remember having conversations with my parents and I was like, I need to work. <laughs> Crying. I'm like, this isn't happening. And mama's like, you know, you can always come home. And I'm like, I can't come home. It's not been six months yet. And, you know, just all of that was happening. And, um, and uh, Travis ended up giving me my first like real job in LA. And I, I just continued working with different people and different artists um, I, um, I went on tour with, with Jennifer Lopez, Will Smith, Ricky Martin, um, Janet, I came back and became Michael's assistant choreographer and, um, funny how things come full circle. I'm like, I ended up being the dangerous girl mm -hmm. for, for Michael on tour. And, um, then I started doing commercials and doing films as a dancer. And then I started transitioning into taking the um, acting classes and um, transitioned into, into, into acting. I got my SAG card as a dancer uh, on the Austin Powers movie with Marguerite Derricks, who hired me, um, who the, the teacher that I had worked with um, those years before in the thing. That's kind of my story-ish, mm -hmm. um, but I will say I was a very shy girl growing up. I spoke through dance. Mm -hmm. I. I, that was my form of expression and communication. Dance has been my lifeline. Um, I only had time growing up from the time of being maybe 10 until I graduated from high school. The only time I had was school and dance. I think it's wonderful that, they, that you all had to have a certain grade point average in order to participate. Um, I, I took all the things that I learned in dance and applied it to my school. And that's why I wanted to go to the school that I wanted to go to. I felt like I had dedicated myself as much to achieving in dance, as much as achieving in school as I did in dance. And I think it's very important that that discipline, that thing that you carry over, dance is such an amazing thing. And it gives you so many, so many skill sets that over time you start to realize the importance of it, even if it doesn't take you into a professional dance career, but the, the, the molding and the crafting of the person and the individual and the tools that it gives you, it, it is priceless. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll continue as you, you know, you keep getting older, you'll continue to, to see the benefit of dedicating yourself. And um, so, yeah, I just was totally immersed. Like I said, I didn't go to like sleepovers or sometimes birthday parties or things because I have rehearsal. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I, and it kept me, what it did dance for me, it gave me a sense of now I will say purpose at the time it felt like accomplishment that didn't have anything to do with any exterior relationship, you know, friendship, anything. It was, it was my connection to myself and mm -hmm. the goals that I set for myself and my ability to accomplish them gave me a sense of confidence. Like I said, I was very shy. So that was where I, I found my voice and I found myself and my expression and, um, and you know, and, and my love. So, um, but that's a little bit of me. Yeah. So you're being um, really humble when you talk about all your accomplishments, Valerie, you do that. That's, <laughs> I've already bragged on you and told them, you know, what an amazing, I think really, well, I don't know how many people people can say that they have had your type of career. I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, I don't often meet people who have done dancers who have been blessed, I would say really, to have experienced such a range of opportunities in dance. I mean, I don't know if the other dance teachers would agree with me. I don't think that's common. And I want the, the other dancer, I mean, I want the students to understand what she has been able to accomplish. It, it, it is not, you know, a, you know, something that everybody has done or can say that they, you know, have on their resume. I mean, people do get to do commercials and people do get to do tours and videos, but 
the level of um, experience that she has is, you know, I don't know, that's just, it sounds like a blessing. It all sounds like God worked, you know, tremendously in your life to lead you, you know, to, to, to yeah, lead you down the path that you've been on. So I, I do want to um, uh, ask you so that you can give them the, and I know someone I think may ask it, but just, um, so these students are from Wilson or they're from even Pine Tops and all, you know, <laughs> you know, small towns. Mm -hmm. um, so their dreams, I don't know how real their dreams feel to them. If I'm looking over here, it's because I'm looking, looking at the students. But I don't know how real their dreams feel to them. I don't know if it feels like something far off. You understand what I'm saying? I'm, you know, you're sitting here in your apartment or your house. I'm talking about the students and um, even my college girls, you know, with the dream seems like it's way over there. So I want them to kind of know what would be the next step, you know, or what is the step, whether you are the college student or if you are, um, this high school or middle school student with this dream? What are the practical steps? Because it may not happen for them the way that it happened for you where somebody's reaching out to them necessarily, but you know, um, what would they need to do? Yeah, <laughs> first, the first thing is to completely immerse yourself in, in dance, in classes, and in a variety of, of techniques. Mm -hmm. and versatility and practicing um, learning choreography, learning it quickly, being able to present it back the way. And that may mean, and, and what I'll say is this, the process of the practice time outside of class mm -hmm. is so paramount because yes. your ability to break the steps down and connect it to, yes, the music, but mm -hmm. But, but to one thing coming after the next and the specificity of where your fingers are, where your arms are, and that's where the technique comes into play. Really honing that, I mean, spending time in the mirror over and over, breaking that routine down by eight count mm -hmm. and doing that. That is the thing that gives you the confidence to perform it and bring yourself to it, which will then allow you to stand out to then where someone who does come across your path will remember you. It's mm -hmm. the, the care that you take on your own that will then shine through. That's the first step. So that when you're stepping out, you're stepping out and you know you have done everything that you can possibly do to perf I don't like to use the word per, 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 you know, to perfect, mm -hmm. but to, um, to just immerse yourself in the details of the choreography to the point where you are able to live in it, mm -hmm. right? That to me is the first step. It's your craft. It's your craft and the confidence that you have in your craft. And I'll say one of the things that going back to why I brought up the fact that the dance competition is that you were being judged on your dance. Someone else was being judged on their dance and they may accrue more points than you did, but all you can do is, is totally be so clear about your dance. Yeah. That's your only job. You can't yeah. control everything else. You can't control how anybody else shows up. It That's is right. just you. And when you do that, then you can let go of the idea that you are competing with anybody else to get a mm -hmm. position or to get a job or to get a role or do any of those things. It is yeah. literally your own relationship with your art. And mm -hmm. you taking that and instead of perfect, I used to pouring as much love into that. Yeah. Pouring much, much love into that thing yeah. is the first step. The next step is I totally understand. I was in, first of all, I was in Euclid. <laughs> my, my husband was doing a radio interview and he mentioned Willow Arms Apartments and they said, woo, mm -hmm. what? And they were like, how? And I'm like, it was not like a place to spawn out and think mm -hmm. that you're gonna go out and do and accomplish anything. So I understand that first your environment. And then also then opportunities. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I will say in that is participating in whatever comes through your way, you will be surprised how you will be connected 
and get access to Mm -hmm. those doors that seem like they're locked for you. Mm -hmm. Follow the path of the love of your, your, your personal passion, what you love to do. That's a God given thing. I'm a firm believer that when you follow that, that you're being led Mm-hmm. into your blessings. You're being led by God into the, those opportunities. You have to put the trust in the love that you have for your thing. There are people from all kinds of different places all across the world in small places that seem like they were hidden. But, but you, know, a, you know, a seed is hidden under the ground mm-hmm. and that thing push, pushes through and it becomes a beautiful flower, a beautiful tree. A beautiful, you have to understand that you've just been planted somewhere, but that doesn't mean that you're not gonna bloom there. It doesn't mean that you won't be able to be seen there. That's the first thing is to get rid of the limitations on your mind. And then the practical things to prepare yourself. Okay, so if this is the thing that you want to do, practice headshots, practice, like I said, different kinds of choreography and executing them, making, you know, tapes of yourself and then examining them, looking at them, finding opportunities where um, people are coming through And, you know, taking those classes or reaching out and seeing online, the online thing right now is just incredible because there's all these other resources to do. But um, if there's anyone doing anything that you want to do to reach out, you know, I think I remember trying to find um, when Jimmy came into town and trying to find um, when Travis and Lavelle they came through and um, finding like, I think I wrote them a letter. I, I called uh, just to, to reach out, to say, I really want to do this. And can you help me? And um, finding those people that can, even when I went out to those teachers, the the teachers have been my everything in Mm -hmm. my, my own career clearly. And the relationships that they have and that Mm -hmm. they have is how I got connected yeah able to do what what I wanted to do and that's usually kind of how it works but there's something specific I feel like I'm not sure if I'm really honing in on that the specifics of like a one two three of the answer it's fine I mean what you're saying is 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 great and I can lead you direct I like I can ask a more direct question but I do want to say one thing that really comes across from you is your passion for dance because people you know they might say oh I love dance I'm a dancer I live and breathe dance you know like we get students who say that all the time but they're totally irresponsible the follow through is not there you know it's just words on a paper you know so one thing that I hope is really coming across that you are you, you're you're showing them and not you know I'm just saying just in your speech and in your you know what you're saying is showing them this is a person who truly loves dance you talked about a commitment to dance as a child not like when you became you know 25 years old you know what I mean your commitment was there from the beginning so that's one thing I hope that they re- that they understand and also um, the thing about taking every opportunity just even participating in these zoom sessions like this this is you know that shows an interest that shows I want to know more I want to be more I want to be greater or if we have any you know if we offer you know new styles or new opportunities take part in that because one thing I noticed you know the social media world is huge and the the dancers online who are you know 50,000 followers 100,000 followers they're like big time on the convention circuit one thing that they do is that they are in everybody's face. By that, I mean, they're taking every class virtually. <laughs> they're tagging the person, letting you know, I'm here, I'm in your class. Um, they're not making excuses for, oh, it's a, we're in a virtual world, you know, so I can't do anything but sit down at home. You know right. what I mean? Um, there any, any convention that is off, you know, just they're putting themselves out there constantly, which is what you're saying. Oh, you know, and every opportunity that arises, they're taking advantage of it. So I'm glad that you made that statement. And that, and lastly, that you said something about you, you reached out to them. So having a, a not a necessarily a boldness, but a personality where you can communicate and, and not be afraid to say, hey, I am interested. Hey, I do want to do this. Instead of, you know, sitting back like, oh, I hope they notice me. But, you know, making them take <laughs> Yeah, that definitely was a was a was a thing. And I will say too, growing up, 
I never lived close to the dance studio. So my mom, we would drive between 45 to an hour for my classes every day. So the idea of going outside of what's just around you in order to receive, in order to get that thing yeah. that you needed. And I did that all, you know, all throughout where my dance studio was always, you know, even here, even in, even in Atlanta, it was 45 minutes to an hour drive without traffic in order yeah. just to get to school, in order right. just to get to the classes. So that I had to wake up at six o'clock in the morning in order to get to the school that I wanted to go to in order to get the training. So having that, that, that definitely that passion and that sense of, of um, tenacity mm -hmm. is something that you definitely are going to need to have to continue something like this because it is, it's true. I remember there was a quote, someone said, Oprah said, Oprah Winfrey, and someone said um, to her, she was like, I wanna be an actress. And they said, no, you don't. She said, yeah, I do. She said, no, you don't. They said, you don't want to get out there and pound the pavement. You don't want to sit in classes for hours at a time. Okay. You don't want to do that. You want the end result. Mm -hmm. and one of the things about being a dancer is it is not the end result. It is the process that will get you to the end result that you have to be willing to do. Right. It's the repetition. And, you know, and your teachers are, are giving you that, but of, un of understanding that you taking what they're doing and you taking that into your own and at home and yes, finding other classes and doing that stuff, immersing yourself in being versatile. Yeah. As yeah. definitely, you know, yes. And, and mine was, I was, the reason why I did reach out, that there was no other option. Yeah. There was nothing else around. Yeah. I was in the dance studio that there was. I was working with the choreographer that was working in this town. There was nothing other than that. Yeah. Right. And so I, when another thing came through, it was like, I have to reach out. I have yeah. to try to see. Now, mind you, I didn't hear back. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get a call back. There wasn't this ongoing conversation. There wasn't, there weren't any of those things. Yeah. I just kind of, I just continued doing what I love to do, what I needed to do. Yeah. And that, that, you know, that thing, it took me. And I applied that into acting. I always say dancing is a doorway. Yeah. All these other rooms, when you take it into becoming professionally, yeah. um, you are now um, outside of that transition of understanding that you are a performer. Yeah. You're an artist was something I, no one sat me down and told me like you're an artist, you know, what I mean? right. a performer. I just went from dance steps to dance steps on the stage right. and understanding the nuances of that transition in between. Um, even when I started auditioning of this, this professional world was different than, than my like class world. Mm -hmm. And so the presentation of yourself came into play and how do you find that without losing, you feel your own self and expression. So I showed up to like one of the first auditions I had in LA and I had on like leotard and tights and like jazz shoes, like let's dance. And folks came in with their like stuff and ponytails and things. I was like, what's happening? This is being more than just dance here. Right. And realizing that when I, when I, um, I had a teacher, um, when I go back to Gary, Gary Harrison and he came through Ailey and he was the one whose modern dance company I was in. And um, he, we didn't know he, he, he wasn't well. And so he had this thing where he sat us all down and then individually talked to us about what he saw in us mm -hmm. and where he kind of thought he, we might want to go. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you know, in our time together, he, um, he was like, you can go to New York. You can go to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like you can do this other kind of route. And funny enough, Travis Payne was one of his students. And, um, and he said, but you need to not make excuses mm -hmm. and just show up and don't give up. Yeah. You have what it takes. Yeah. Absolutely. You don't give up. I had another teacher, Terry Payton, when I was um, probably around 14 or 15. I had gone through some, some stuff and, um, and I was auditioning for to be a part of like her top like level of four kids in competition. And I didn't make it. Mm -hmm. And she, and I was devastated. And she taught me the routine that I auditioned with for the company. And I'm like, we supposed to have this in the bag. Like what, how did this not happen for me? And I was, I was upset and I was 
feeling kind of, you know, dejected. And she looked at me and she said, because when you come in here, I don't want you to come in and be in the back. Mm -hmm. I want you to come in and be in the front. Right. And she said, you've lost the eye of the tiger. Mm -hmm. Used to have it. She said, you can be one of the best things that walk out of this studio, Mm -hmm. but it's going to be your choice and your decision. Right. And so I learned then how to compartmentalize and restructure my perspective of of what rejection is, of Mm -hmm. what no means. Yeah. And understand that none of those things are supposed to be a stop sign for you. They can be a reevaluation, but don't ever let it stop you from doing what you want to do, what you love to do and what you've prepared yourself to do. And that's the preparation, truly being prepared for that opportunity because the opportunity is going to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Your life has purpose. It has meaning. Mm-hmm. And we are, our, our purpose, a lot of times what we love to do and our passion gives us insight into that thing that we're supposed to do. Exactly. And as long as you continue to move in that and to be prepared before you step out yeah. so that you know what the end is before you start. Mm-hmm. Don't just go out and say, I'm going to try this thing. I'm going to see what happens. Mm-hmm. Prepare yourself to the point where you know you are ready to do it That's and right. you know what you're going to get. And don't stop until you get it. I've got so many friends who they worked, um, maybe not as much as they wanted to work, but now they're like the top choreographers, Mm -hmm. you know, in the game. They didn't stop, you know, and so I won't name their names, but they didn't stop, you know, and um, so I, I, that's one of the, that's one of the, the main things I have. I have a real heart for for students and for young young people that feel like that the pathway to their dream may not be so clear. Yeah. Is that how I was? Yeah. You know, I I I just had this thing that I wanted to do that I loved to do. I loved how it made me feel about myself. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to continue to do it. I saw other people doing, but I didn't know if I could be one of those people. I know what it feels like to feel so like to have this low self-esteem to not see yourself on the same playing field or level as someone else. All that has happened is that they've had opportunities that you have not yet had. They're not different than you. I'm no different than you Mm -hmm. in, 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 you know, as far as what you can accomplish just because I've already been doing things that, that, that dynamic, that understanding that it's just about the opportunity that comes and you doing everything that you possibly can to prepare yourself um, to the best of your ability and to maximize that thing, you know? It's like, if you're doing three pirouettes, what is it for you to do four? What right. else would it take within yeah. you to push yourself? Do you want to do seven? You can do seven. Right. You may have to practice more. Mm-hmm. It's like, what, what do you need to do to fit in that extra time to accomplish that specific goal you have in dance? Do you have dance goals? Do you have things that you want to accomplish? Do you have techniques that you want to master? You know, and and being versatile in in the craft will allow you to be versatile in the opportunities you're able to maximize and and participate in. One of the reasons why I've been able to um, work with lots of different kinds of people was there was a goal to be able to perform different styles and kinds of dance yeah you know can you speak to kind of what what does make somebody stand out you know we try to prepare the the kids for you know eventually when they get to the level that you know where you were working that everybody is talented and everybody is beautiful and everybody you know is prepared and all of that so what is the difference with in your opinion when you walk into an audition of you know 500 people that are all you know, fantastic. What makes somebody stand out in an audition like that? So, and can I take it back on to that, what she was saying? Because that's what I was thinking next. Um, like, if you have done the preparation, as you're saying, and now you're there in LA or you're in New York, mm-hmm. you, yeah, or now you could even be in Atlanta, but you're wherever you want to be, right. and you're in the audition. What is, what do you need to bring in terms of technique, performance, your physical um, appearance? Um, what are the things that you need to, come with or be prepared to do. Okay. 
So there was, um, back in the day, I'm trying to remember who it was that said it. it Might've been Marguerite or something. Yes, it was. She said, from the moment you walk in the door, pretend you're on camera. Mm -hmm. So you are, you're being observed. Not that you're being judged, you're just being observed. Right. But when you come into the room, understand this is now your domain, right? Mm -hmm. So you come in, you're prepared, you um, are present, you're attentive. You'd be surprised the people who are talking and this, and you know what I mean? And you are respectful to the choreographer. And I would say being clean, mm -hmm. being able, if someone presents to you an eight count, being able to, I would say, throw it back to them the yeah. way they threw it to you. Yeah. Right? So if the arm is here, mm -hmm. please don't have the arm here. Right. <laughs> this is where the arm is. Right. right. If the fingers are closed, please make sure your fingers aren't like this. Right. Subtleties in the details of your movement is going to be the thing that lets you keep going through. Because that's the first thing that they're looking for. Are you literally giving me my choreography the way I need to see it? Because if it's for 50 people or if it's for five people and one person's like this and the other person needs to be like that. So you have to really care. That's why I say I'm trying to re kind of contextualize the word perfect. Because we'll say we're going to perfect the movement. How much love are you putting into the movement? Right. How much do you care and respect and honor the movement? that's going to be the first thing that's going to stand out is first of all, they're hitting the count. Right. Right where the count needs to go. And right. then your ability, how fast you learn. Yeah. Why I say constantly learning routines, take other routines off of, you know, YouTube or things or whatever, and just practice your skill of learning choreography. And that's a muscle that, yeah. that you can strengthen because sometimes, sometimes in an audition, you may have an hour and you'll, they'll break you up into groups and you can go over here and you can practice your routine a couple of times, four or five times a day. And sometimes it's like, and five, six, seven, eight, I gave it to you three times. Okay. And let's go. Yeah. And so whoever's able to um, retain the choreography, the, the fastest, that's yeah. going to stand out. Okay. Oh, she already got it. Okay. Because mm -hmm. what happens is there are lots of changes that happen once you are working. Sometimes the time frame in which you have, like I just did a video with Adina Menzel and Billy Porter. We had no days of rehearsal. They were like, can we just do it on set? So <laughs> I saw the dancers because they were dancers that they already had. I showed up and we had, you know, nine o'clock in the morning, we had to film by one. They had to learn a whole song and then be ready to shoot it. Mm -hmm. So though that skill set, that muscle, that is going to, and it's also just gonna make you feel more confident in the room mm -hmm. because let's say you're nervous, right? And so you're trying to just get through the moment and remember the steps and do all that stuff. You want that muscle to be strong already, right? That's, that's the, this time is for that. Once you've done that, then it's gonna be like, okay, how are you feeling the music? So we call, you know, you interpret the music, interpret the song, you're hitting it or there, whatever. That's what of you, what you feeling, what the music makes you feel. How are you able to bring that into the routine that's being presented? And if it's hard hitting, can you hit it hard? Right. I don't want you to hit soft if it's, you're supposed to be like hard and you've given me this. I want, I want, so are you able to match those things? Right. And then, um, and I won't say how, not how easy it feels to, but effortless. That yeah. I'm able to do all of that right. and make it feel like this is effortless. And it's that you're living in the routine, you're living in the music. Like, are you able to, and I always, I was one thing I love to do that I would do growing up that I do tell people is whatever the song is, and this is something that will train your muscle. So when you do hear a song, well, when you're in class now, and you have the songs and you go home and you listen, lay on the floor, close your eyes, turn the lights out and just listen to the music. Mm -hmm. And then do it again and listen to the music with the dance in your head. Mm -hmm. And then do it again and then try to understand and see, oh, that kick is on a six. Oh, but that's right when the cymbal hits. Right. Do you understand? So then it'll start to train your mind to match the movement to the music. So right. then when you go to the audition process, you'll hear that song over and you're like, oh, so now you're not counting anymore. Yeah. 
now you've become the three-dimensional embodiment of the song of the music yes that is yeah. going to make you stand out mm-hmm. every single time yeah and then, are you comfortable with the way that you look Because I think a lot of times we try to find a look or find a way to present ourselves in a way that other people will think we look good and things like that stuff, you know? Are you satisfied when you look at yourself? Is it a thing? Like, and you know, when I first started off, um, you know, it was like, it was, you know, it's the presentation is all the thing. I tried to get a weave, right? (laughs) My hair was like right here. And I was like, I seen all these girls and it was like stuff and the ponies and the things. And I was like, okay, what, what, I'm trying stuff on. Cause like I said, I showed up with the leotard and tights. I was like, this is not gonna work. <laughs> so I tried to get a weave and I was, it was, <laughs> I was auditioning for a Brian McKnight tour, which later I did end up getting years later, uh, a year later. But at this particular juncture, it was this audition and it was so many girls. And when I tell you, it was so hot. Now, for me, with the weave, part of the hair was out, part of the hair was in. Mm-hmm. The moment I started sweating. <laughs> started curling up. And so it was two different things happening at the same time. <laughs> and I was like, as much as this weave on the bottom is great, <laughs> I am not looking put together here. Right. And so I was like, I have to shift this. Like, what am I going to do? <laughs> like, well, I have curly hair. hmm So I started, you know, like braiding my hair and then like curling it at the ends. And that became what I did. I wasn't trying to be the, you know, there was nobody really doing their hair like back in 98, like that, you know, my dance stuff. But I, it was out of like necessity. I didn't have a choice. So my signature look was just because it was me. Mm. It just became me. And the only other time, if I did have something that was swirling, hair was slicked back with a ponytail up at the top and that was that was that was me um so as far as like your look is concerned it, what what do you, what makes you feel like your best self that right. you feel represents you right and you can't look to how someone else looks there was a girl one of my good friends um she was um same thing, she had, like curly hair. She tried to dye her hair and do this stuff, but she didn't feel like herself. Mm-hmm. What do you feel like yourself? And sometimes we try to put on other people's clothes, we put on other people's hair, we try to put on other people's makeup, put on other people's face. You know, I have people tell me so all kinds of things I should change. I ain't changed nothing, right? right. I ain't clipped nothing, I'm cut nothing. That's just me. Some people have, I, that just wasn't what I could do. So accentuate what you already are and what you already have and know it's by design and it's beautiful and it's enough. Mm -hmm. And just find what works for you. And it'll be trial and error. Some things will work. Some things won't. Won't. But um, also when you're you're going in, so back into the audition process. So that becomes like your presentation of how you felt that day. Sometimes Mm -hmm. people, I felt like wearing heels. Sometimes I just didn't, but I had them in the bag in case we needed to use them. You know, so it just depends on, and that's when you realize, oh, this is where I get to become an artist. Mm -hmm. This is where I come from beyond just my job is to give you the the choreography back so then you can choose me. This is my little moment where I get to be the performer, approach it as though it is an opportunity to perform and not an opportunity to be chosen. You Mm -hmm. will enjoy the process so much more and realizing you can look at it just like it's another dance class. You know what I mean? The mindset, the perspective that you have Fortifying your mind is going to be just as important as fortifying your your craft, your skill set, and understanding that the pressure that that is present is something that you can control. It's something you're either putting on yourself, yeah, you know I'm saying, or something that you're letting be, be lighter. Because all on being on both sides of it, when I'm on this side, I just want somebody to shine. I just want them to take the thing, take the routine, and crush it, live in it. Mm-hmm. all the way it's exciting it's fun yeah. don't hold back right push yourself extend it extend the movement don't right. put your your you know the fingers and the toes are part of the body let them speak you know cohesively those those things will you'll stand out every every time mm-hmm. and then you also have to remember 
that you are now still trying to be a part of someone else's vision, someone else's idea of what they think, and you can't take it personally. Yeah. I realized like dance at one time, I don't think it's, it's not, I've talked to people, it's not so much anymore, but at the time, and I'll just say it, it was like, you know, they would have one, maybe two black girls. It was like, and they couldn't look the same. It had to be, you know, it was all of these things encompassing, um, you know, it was like they had, you know, oh, you have one. And it became very specific on culture and race, you know what I mean? As far as things looked, you had to make sure it was this or that. And that I'm glad has gotten kicked out of the box, but the, but the mindset behind this comparison when it came into look, just focus on the dance. Do not get hung up in even how your hair is or all that kind of, like that's not gonna be the driving thing, right? Um, I, and remember one, I remember is this um, football player, Roethlisberger, and he said, it was after a loss. And he said, one football game doesn't make or break my career. Mm -hmm. One audition isn't gonna make or break all the other things. Because remember, you've already started knowing that you're here to receive some really fun, exciting, wonderful you know, experiences, some really fun, wonderful jobs, some really fun, gonna walk through some really great doors that are gonna lead to some other rooms that perhaps you, I didn't think about acting when I first started that are gonna, you're gonna experience and, and be open to. So one moment of rejection isn't gonna make or break your career unless you decide this is the, the end, you know? And then, and, and, and it's, you know, that'll be up to the individual. Right. Before we let the, the kids ask questions, because I know they're ready, um, I have one more question. So again, going back to um, getting off of the plane and now you're in LA and you don't know what to do or you're in uh, New York, um, do, I need to, do I need an agent? Is that, is that, my, um, is that important that I have an agent um, as a dancer or do, am I just to ask the same thing? And also how do you find the, uh, so, you know, you arrive in this new city, you don't know anybody. You're literally just starting fresh out of high school, fresh out of college, no money, no nothing. Yeah. What, you know, what's the first step when you get to the place that you, the city that you decided you want to make it happen in? And then, and if the city where you're, where you are, doesn't have it because it's always great. Right. To start. It feels like where you are, wherever it is, if no matter how, where if it's in reach where you are pursue it you don't okay. always have to go all the way out of you know the the fishbowl in order to start so start wherever you are start wherever you are see what other opportunities are present like i was doing total entertainment i was dancing for bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs like that was a start mm -hmm. you know start somewhere and don't judge it that's the first thing Mm -hmm. Then if you decide, you know what, I want to go out to where there are these more opportunities than what I have here. Maximize whatever you can where you are mm -hmm. and then go out and where you are there. Yes. Start taking dance class, get immersed into the culture, get immersed into the community, go to, um, if a friend or a friend or someone wants you to dance in a in a, in a concert or in a presentation or in a short film and it's not pain, do it. Mm -hmm. I started working with um, Fatima Robinson because um, I was going to this one class and Omar and he was having um, a thing at the time, they have a thing called the um, it's like choreographers convention. And where once a month they would, choreographers or teachers would just present their pieces to, and they'd invite different people to be able to highlight their you know, their skill set. And because I danced in that, Fatima came up to me after seeing me in that and asked me my information and where I was from and all this stuff. And I started working with her after that. Allow yourself to be seen, first of all. Then when it comes to getting an agent, okay, so this is why class is important. The community of dance is important because somebody you know in that class has is represented. And if they are, you ask them, hey, do you think you could, you know, set up a meeting with your agent and myself, have them just send over your information, your headshot. If you have a little reel of yourself, record yourself in dance classes so you can create a little reel that shows what you can do. Have that presentation with you before you go anywhere. You know what I mean? Have a reel, something that shows your dancing without me having to see you come into the room ahead of time, right? So you have that. 
and then you'll build on that. And then um, if not, then you find out the all the dance um, agencies in whatever city you're in, whatever city you're in, mm -hmm. they have like a little directory. You contact them and find out when they're having open calls because every dance agent is always looking for new talent and they will have what it's called, it's a basically an audition, um, an agent, they call it an agency call. And you'll come and you'll go through the same kind of experience that you would in an audition. They'll have someone teach the different styles of dance and then the agents will be there watching and then they'll decide if there's people that they see that they would like to um, be a part of the agency. And that's a because you're always constantly looking for new fresh talent mm -hmm. and um, those opportunities are very much present and real and so it's like you connect with someone who already has an agent ask them to pass your information along and see what their people say mm -hmm. and then you find the open calls open calls really do work i got my first television show as a series regular from the open call in la i went to the open call the line was wrapped all around the back of the building but i got it right okay. so it does work and it does happen would you say in um, North Carolina, maybe at, would we would they look in cities like um, like uh, Raleigh, Charlotte? I mean, I, they would have to be a little bit larger than or larger than Wilson, but the more metropolitan cities is that where they would look in this that's, area? That's absolutely where they where they would look, and then yeah. um, you could do like the research and find and probably connect um, also with some of the performing arts schools and like the colleges and the other things that are you know in North Carolina would have access to that information that then could be connected to, you know, a little funnel, if you will, to, um, to that. I know that there are agencies in Atlanta that do have lots of work in different parts of North Carolina. So even if it's not right there, like the next place over could have those resources and, and at least, you know, connect. Mm -hmm. Go to the open calls, go to the master classes, yeah. go to those places. Marguerite Derricks remembered me when I came into her classes at 16 years old. So when I was back in, in Los Angeles and I was 21 doing the ropes and auditions, I was going still to her classes when I came in because a lot of those choreographers that are teaching class are also working. And they will pull from their classes because these are the people that know their choreography. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you are taking those class. When you do go to those other places, you find you go to those dance studios and you find out who's teaching and you start going to those classes. I went to everybody's class. Yeah. I wanted to. I really wasn't thinking they're going to hire me because I didn't even know that that's how that worked at the time. I had no idea. So, but go and that's that is kind of like the way to to get into um working professionally as a, as a dancer i happen to have an agent because i got michael and so the agent said when you come to la call me i'll represent you right. so i learned through osmosis the process of of what works and also you know so i know and there are people and they will say yeah i have my agent i'll call i'll call them up Mm -hmm. I'll send the stuff over for you. And so that's how those things work. And I, the reason why I shared that is I don't ever want you to forget that wonderful, incredible things that you could not even imagine will work out for you mm -hmm. on this process. Yeah. There will be some things that are just by the book and there'll be other things that'll be like so-and-so and then this happened and that. I am not the only person that has a story of connection through you know a class or through a choreographer and that's how they got a job or how they got their agent or how they that's in it's a community and it's a it's a cohesive thing so that's why I say go to that city get plugged into that community find the dance studios find the choreographers that are working see when they're teaching find the open calls for those dance um, agents and get it and the reason why you want it now they also have casting um, things online that you can sign up for sign up to be um, background. Sign up to be, you know, they used to, you know, a background performer. There are commercials that are non-union that give you the experience that 
you know, you have your headshot, you have your, you know, your resume. It, and a lot of times it's, it doesn't matter about that. It's about um, the fact that there's this pool of talent that needs to be used for this particular job. And so put yourself on those online casting, the reputable casting frontier, casting those um, sites. And you can do that even from, you know, they can do that from Wilson. You know what I mean? You can submit yourself from anywhere. Yeah. And those opportunities are incredible. Um, because you don't necessarily need to be repped by an agent in order to get the job. Okay, cool. so the, agents, the agent is the middle person between the creators mm -hmm. and the talent. Mm -hmm. And so the creators say, I want to do this video. I want to do this tour. I want to do this um, movie, this commercial. I need talent. They go to an agent who has the pool of talent that will then send it over to them. They look at them and they decide who fits this specific project. But this middle person isn't the end all be all to getting this opportunity. My experience is one of them. Plenty of the people that have that experience too. But having an agent increases your, it's a numbers game, increases the number of opportunities that you can then be presented for that could fit you. So it is a, it's something that you want to put in your arsenal. It's something that you definitely want to have as a goal. That is not going to be the only way that you will work. So if you don't have an agent and you feel like you don't know how you're going to get an agent, that does not mean that you won't work. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say you have to have this mentality of understanding there, there is a will, there is a way that this thing is going to happen yeah. for you. Um, if, if you so choose believe, to believe that, I, you know, I'm a firm believer in that. I've you know, been doing this over 20 years. I've seen so many other people have that same mindset. You do want to cultivate your mind. Your mind. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. great. That's awesome. Um, we do want to sh um, shift now into having the kids ask questions. So um, Mrs. Moran, um, if you would start that section. Yeah, so our first uh, question is from Caitlin McNeil. I'm gonna spotlight her so that you can see who's talking. Um, my question is, have you ever felt overwhelmed before performance or when learning choreography? If so, how did you cope with these feelings? Hi, Caitlin. Yes, I have absolutely felt overwhelmed with choreography and before performance. And what I, what I started to do is simply take one step at a time. Literally, it, for me, it begins and ends with the dance itself. The moment you are feeling overwhelmed is because you are now externally thinking about someone else's approval, <clears throat> about who's in the audience. You're thinking about comparing yourself to see whether or not you're gonna do it the best of your ability. You as an artist, this all that's happening now is this is an opportunity for you to experience your own gift. It says that God gives gifts, right? And lots of times we think about this gift is to be shared for other people. It's your gift. So the moment you begin to focus on something outside of yourself is when the fear can come in, the judgment, the criticism, and that feeling. Go back into the steps, go back into the music and just take one step at a time. I would a lot of times before, before things just sit and just go through the dance in my head. You just go through the dance in my head before it was time to do it. And that would calm me, that would give me, that would anchor me to one, remember what I'm here to do. And um, two, allow me to go back into what, what I love, you know? Does that, does that answer, does that help? <laughs> Yeah, I think you're going to find that's kind of a common theme in some of the questions, you know, that we, uh, you know, our, our students often, I think, do struggle with kind of how to, how to handle that feeling of not, I don't know if it's really that they're like overwhelmingly nervous, but they're just, you know, there's a little block in their mind in terms of like, I know I, I know I can do it, but what if I can't, or I don't know what the, what the mental block is, but it, it seems like they're just one step away from, you know, unleashing themselves, yeah. And, and one of the things I will say is that means take more time outside of class to mm -hmm. immerse yourself in the steps. Yeah. If it's just one, if it's just one routine mm -hmm. that you say, I'm going to feel like I've mastered it where I can do it without the music. I can do it without counting out loud. I can do it, you know, backwards, forwards, inside out, learn that one routine. And so then you'll feel the difference in how much confidence you have when it's time to perform that, that routine or when it's time to do it again. And when I tell you over and over, I mean over and over and over and over. 
I mean, go home and practice it because the confidence comes with how much time you spend with the thing. Mm -hmm. That's where confidence comes from. Like I'm sitting in this chair, right? Got this chair here. I come and I just sit down. I'm not, you know, looking at the chair, trying to see whether or not it's going to hold me up because I have spent time with chairs and I know chairs, when you sit on them, unless they're broken, they're going to hold you up, right? The same thing, the same principle is, is applied in your craft. The yeah. more time you spend with it, the more time you spend with that routine, the more time you spend strengthening that muscle, the more confident you'll, ha you'll be. And um, you might still get that little flicker, but it might be excitement as opposed to, I'm going to mess up. Yeah. I'm afraid of messing up. I'm afraid of missing this thing. But it, you spent time with that thing over and over and over again. It's going to squash. It's going to squeeze that little feeling out. You're going to wring it out with your repetition. That's, that's actually what Misty Copeland said, too, because they asked a very similar question or the same question to her. And that was the same answer. You know, the, the more you are ready, prepare yourself in advance. I mean, you know, like she said, the muscle memory, all that comes into will take over. Um, even if you do start to feel a little nervous, but you have it down so well that it's it's going to go well. So the preparation. Preparation. Uh, yeah. Number two is very similar, I think, to what you've answered. What do you think, Miss Moran? I was gonna say the same thing. We can skip to Aliana. I have her right here. So this okay. is one of our high school students. Okay. My question was, what are some major things you need to do to get your name out there and more in your art form? Yeah, the main uh, things to get your name out there. Yeah, I think it, it, maybe in some of the things that you've already said, you addressed that about um, in your in the introduction and in what we, you know, kind of the questions I asked, you were talking about, you know, doing as much as you can, taking every opportunity. So I think you did cover that a lot, but if you want to, if there's anything else you want to add to that, feel free to. Well, let's make it more specific. Um, I think and concise in you want to get your name. You want to be clear about who do you want your name to be out there for? Mm -hmm. So you want to be sure that it's for those that, that um, can help you get more work basically, you know what I mean? In a nutshell. So that means you want to immerse yourself in the community. You want to become a part of the dance community, prof the professional dance community of where you are. So that means you want to be seen when you are coming into dance class. You want to be on time. You want to be professional. You want to ask them questions. You want to cultivate the, those kinds of relationships that with the, with the teachers and the choreographers. And I think too, focusing on your real, and now there's this whole other social media online mm -hmm. presence that happens. And so you could be doing things as far as, you know, getting with other, other, you know, dancers and putting snippets of yourself dancing, mm -hmm. you know, snippets of that on there and out there. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, as far, cause that your name is gonna be connected to truly your ability. Yeah. You know? So you want to you want to know how you're going to get your dancing out there. Yeah. Think about it from that aspect. You'll be like, oh, it doesn't it won't feel so overwhelming. It won't feel so um, daunting. Like I got to get my name out. I got people got to right. know. People got to know. They need to know how you dance. Right. And yeah. approach it from from that first. Yeah. And then all these other ways of that are going to present yourself because it's different for each person. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, our, next, our next answer, she had a question. She's going to ask her question, but she also wanted to ask another one um, from one of our students that wasn't able to come today. But they, they want to know, with little or no money backing you to start in a new place, what, you know, what are their options or how do they cope with that or deal with that? How do they get through that if they're trying to move somewhere new, but they don't really have the financial backing to do so? So I would say the first thing that you do is you have to work, you know, and that may mean working at the mall, that may mean waitressing, that may mean whatever that is and create a budget and a savings. And you'll know that you're ready to go to that place when you have a certain amount of money, I'd say that can cover your first month. And find a place to work when you're there that allows you 
some type of flexibility, which is why most people they end up in going into retail or they end up in, you know, waitressing, working at a, a juice spot, a smoothie, sh- you know, find some place to work that will supplement you while you are building your career. And then you allow the amount of work that you have building your career to get stronger than your work. And that's when you know you're doing it full time. Mm. It's a process. Right. You know, it's, a, it's a step into it. Um, and, 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 and wherever you are before you can move there, begin to create those, oppor- you know, find those other opportunities that allow you to feel like you are moving forward in what you're doing. That means continue to take class. That means continue to go reach out. Maybe you're driving an hour and a half to go take this convention thing and meet this choreographer that's from New York or from Chicago, or you know what I mean? Go see, immerse yourself in, in, in plays and musicals and theaters, hone your craft, hone whatever it is until you get the green light for yourself. And I know that may seem, especially when you don't have anything. That's why I didn't want to go to LA at first. I was like, I don't have a car. I don't have money for rent. I don't have a job. I'm like, what, what do I do? And you start to focus when you set your intention on something and your expectation, life has a way of meeting you there. And, and it is possible. My grandmother's church put together $500 for me to have my plane ticket to go to LA. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, um, it will be, it will be a, um, you won't do it alone. And um, there are ways of engaging other people in your dream to help in the, in that regard. You'll be surprised how, you know, $20 will over time will, will, will add up to enough for you to, 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 to be able to do what you need to do. Um, go ahead, Jennifer. Uh, my question was, have you ever doubted a decision or choice you have made and if so, how did you manage with it? Hmm. Of course. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of a specific example. There was a time, well, there was one thing I, I'm glad I did do and then I have one that I, that I didn't do. There was, it's, it's while I was doing this dance and I was competing and I remembered I chose not to do my solo. And I chose not to do it because I was afraid of not winning. Mm. And that same thing showed up later when I had a choice whether I was gonna audition for Janet. And I, and I was like, I don't wanna go and not get it. I was so afraid mm-hmm. of, of failing or of not getting something that it was keeping me from moving forward. And I had to examine why am I not going? I had to examine what does that mean? Did I examine all of the things like, okay, so if I, if it doesn't work out for me, what does that mean? And that's where that whole understanding was like, one thing's not gonna make or break my career. One, one time of messing up a step. I literally one time was in an audition and it was um, for a role and I was doing a freestyle. And I kicked my leg up and I went splat on the floor in the middle of the thing. And the overcoming of rejection, the overcoming of disappointment, the overcoming of that, and realizing that you just, when those moments happen, a decision or a choice that you make that you are not comfortable with or that you chose to do, you have to remember that there is gonna be another opportunity for you to make a different choice. That you have to create a mindset that it is not over that there is a the redemption's always possible that it will it will be okay and you can continue if you choose to continue okay that's that's uh yeah that's good they they definitely need to hear that too um you know to be able to move on from a mistake like that and it not you know i, I think every dancer can relate to that oh absolutely and the, the biggest thing is okay is to and i feel like one of the things that is important is that you know yourself and that you take the time to ask yourself, okay, what was my, you know, we always talk about motivation and things or whatever, your intention, and you start off in a, in a routine and you know the, the song, you know the story that you're telling and all that kind of stuff. So with yourself, you do the same thing. Why did I decide to do that? What, mm-hmm. what, was, a, what was driving me? Was I being driven by love? Was I being driven by fear? Mm-hmm. Was I being driven out of, being out of peace and confidence and assuredness? 
or was I being driven out of, you know, trying to prove myself and realize that I wasn't being true to myself. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that I did to overcome any of those things. I started to realize like, I really understand that I don't need to compromise who I am, what I believe in order to work. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I went through a time, sometimes there were some things I felt uncomfortable wearing as a dancer back when I was doing it. It was like a whole nother little shifting was coming in and it was away from like really how your technique and it was really only about how you looked and how well you could shake your behind. And it was like that thing and navigating that and realizing that, you know, you can speak up. You do have a voice. I didn't have to. I got, you know, stuff was changed. Outfits were changed. Things were made longer. Realizing that you, you don't have to compromise yourself for your dream. Mm -hmm. The dream is going to meet you where you are. You don't have to become something other than who you are for mm -hmm. opportunities to come to you. Anytime mm -hmm. an opportunity comes to you, you have to understand that it's not bigger than you. It's meeting you where you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's great. Um, number seven um, is going to be from Chloe. What have been some of your most memorable moments as a performer? Um, my most memorable was the first time on stage in London with Michael Jackson and the thousands and thousands of people and realizing that that thing that I had dreamed and prayed and hoped for had actually happened that that single moment like I can go back to it right now and just looking out right before it started that that's the single most like profound thing for me it was a culmination of all the years of doubt and um insecurity and disappointment and realizing the dream was bigger than all of that and it happened mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't even imagine what that might have even felt like, or I don't know if it, if you could, you know, if that's even something that could be described, that feeling of that type, that level of accomplishment. You know, I tried to explain to the kids how big, and, and I think, I think they get it. They, they understand who Michael Jackson was or, you know, and, and how huge that is to have that opportunity. So I, you know, uh, thousands of screaming fans and the energy mm -hmm. and just knowing that you're up there with Michael Jackson, I can imagine that is one of your most memorable, if not the most memorable moments, knowing that you had achieved, you know, that. And that was like your first job. <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> so we're going to um, skip Mina. Um, she's not here. We have three more questions. The next one is going to be from, we have three more student questions. And then um, my College students that are here, if you have any questions, go ahead and start thinking thinking about what you may want to ask. But we're going to go to Jasana, uh, and Jasana, you can unmute yourself. Hey, how many times do you practice the week before a performance or recording of a movie? Okay, so I practice every single day, multiple times a day, and it's um it's definitely a skill set and something that I started doing, like I said, when I was just taking dance classes, when it was something that I wanted to, you know, like get to this place of, of uh, feeling like I kind of like mastered where I felt comfortable. I could do this routine in front of anybody at any time, no matter what. I would practice until I felt like that. So it'll be different depending on the routine. It'll be different depending on, you know, on you and on how much time you have I have done I mean hours hours and hours every day so when I say if I have a class on Monday and they gave that routine by the time that next Monday came around I was definitely for sure going to know it like the back of my hand and so that meant I was at home and I would break down the eight count and if it was just even if it was just this movement I would do this when I tell you over and over again until I felt like it was effortless, until I knew I didn't have to think about it anymore. So if I got to a point and I got it from my dance teacher, Terry, if I got to a point and I forgot a step, I started from the, from the, from the top. And I went all the way through till I get to that. And I do the same thing like in acting when it comes to lines. You know, I go and then if I stop, I examine what, what's going on. What did I forget? Examine the step before it, examine the step after it, and then examine the music. And so sometimes, oh, here comes the drum. I know my, you know what I mean? I know this happens on this part. 
So you've got to fine tune it and you got to find it for you. And this is, this is when it becomes artistry. This is when it steps outside of just being steps where you're able to learn to live in the dance is when you have allowed yourself the time and the process to um, break it down to where it makes sense for you. Because it came from someone else, right? It's a step, if it's not your own choreography, it's someone else's words, it's someone else's, you know, I, it, the steps are words, it's someone else's movement that you've got to now dissect. You're now a researcher, you're now understanding it. You got to get behind that thing and take the time to do that. So I would say I practice every day until I felt com until I felt comfortable. And nobody can tell you how long that that is for you. For me, it was a lot <laughs> for me to feel comfortable. Right. Yeah. But do it, please. <laughs> please. Awesome. <laughs> please. Please, please. You know, just yeah. that's the process. Um, the next question, it was going to be about um, dance team, but I think that you pretty much have addressed um, what's necessary for really any type of audition for any style. So we're going to go to um, the last um, student question, and that's going to be from Kelsey. Hi. Hi. <laughs> when my question to you is, when not working, how do you spend your free time? I love watching TV and movies. Um, and uh, playing with my kids. But um, that's like, I, I love doing, I love that. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I do. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're a working mom, that's most of your time. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I'm not working. So if it's not I'm not working on a script, yeah. I'm not writing something, I'm not creating something. Yeah. I that's just free time. My favorite thing to do is to sit down and watch a movie. My mom and I used to go watch movies like twice every weekend and you know, break mm -hmm. open the piggy bank sometimes and take coins to go to the movie theater. So mm -hmm. that's my jam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Ariana or Taylor, do you have any questions that you want to ask? <laughs> Hi. Um, so I know that um, support systems are very important and I wanted to basically just ask like when you don't have a support system or those people around you, what do you do to just keep going and uplifting yourself? And that was something I'm glad you, you asked that question because um, so much of this is internal, right? And so much of the dance experience is just, you know, specifically with you. And um, you do have to practice because I'll say this, even if you do have a support system, they're still not in your mind, in your thoughts. Because you can have all the support, all the external support in the world, but if you yourself are not at a place where your thoughts are positive mm -hmm. and are serving you, mm -hmm. it is not going to matter what mm -hmm. anybody else says. People can tell you you're beautiful all mm -hmm. day long. But if you don't look in the mirror and find the beauty in your future, in your own features, it's not going to matter. So mm -hmm. as much as having a support system is fantastic, and it is to be able to fuel you when perhaps you are doubting yourself, you will still have the moments that no matter what they say, you, you will still question. I've had times where I've wanted to quit and not, you know, for whatever the different reasons were, and it wasn't until I made the decision within myself that I was gonna stay, that it really mattered. So what I will say is fortify yourself first before you embark on this journey, because it's gonna be a lot of rejection, a lot of all those kinds of things, right? But it's a beautiful process and um, you have to learn to encourage yourself. You have yeah. to learn to speak over yourself. You have to learn to look at yourself and say, if it wasn't, say your your leap wasn't where you wanted it to be. You have to create the mindset that you're not looking at what it isn't, but you keep seeing what it could be mm -hmm. and know with yourself that you have the potential to, to, to get it there, right? So the same thing, that same principle, that's why I say the principles behind dancing and achieving in dance can be extracted and put into anything else that you're gonna do 
when it comes down to it's just you and the music, right? The same thing that when it comes down to an opportunity or the decision to keep going or to find a way to do it, that thing within yourself that believes that you have the capability, that you have the capacity in order to achieve this thing is going to be paramount for yeah. yourself. Know it for yourself. And that's when you'll know whether or not you have a support system. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, yeah, I was going to say, Ariana, you know, Ms. Foster supports you, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know I'll be your support system. Yeah, sometimes people have people supporting them in the wrong direction. So we mm -hmm. just have to quantify what it means to have support. You can have support in someone being allowing you to be, you know, mediocre. You can have yeah. all kinds of support systems. Mm -hmm. And so if you cannot put one merit on the other, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And put more onus on what it is that you believe. And then understanding that when you get to that point of not believing or whatever that is, because the support is to be there when you fall, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Feeling like you have a support system that you do, that you're able to identify, you know, people in your life that, that you can call, that you can write, you know, sometimes for people, it's not anybody that they know. It's just somebody else that believed in themselves that they can, you know, look, look at. They, there's some wonderful master classes that are available online that I like to watch people's interviews you can read other people's biographies and find out those things, those tenets within themselves that they experiences that they push past in order to be where they are um, and take those tidbits for yourself as strengths, things that they, things that they've held on to, to, to let you know. And sometimes support is financial and sometimes support is emotional and then identifying which one are you needing at the time. And that's why I say get into the community because the dance community is such a beautiful, powerful, um, powerful force and uh, immerse yourself in it and you'll find all the dreamers, you know, there together. And uh, it, it's a, it, it, it can be, if you choose, you know, the right ones to be a, a really beautiful experience on your journey to fortifying and encouraging yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Taylor. Hi, sorry, I'm in the car, I'm traveling. But my question is more concerned, like um, around like, did you ever have to be on like a specific diet, like eating habits and stuff and like specific exercises and stuff like that? Cause that's where I like struggle with the most. Okay. So I would say I don't like diet, right? Because mm -hmm. everybody's body is different and you really truly don't need to try to become anything other than you. With that said, are you healthy? Mm -hmm. So are you, are, you, are you eating in a way that is fueling your body? So are, and then are you um, identifying those things that, you know, that whether you wanted to be a dancer or anything else, that would then be zapping your strength. I, my question is always, is it serving you or is it not serving you? So, you know, there's a whole bunch of donuts going to serve you, maybe not, but everything in moderation, right? So I would say if you, the, the goal is to make sure that you're in a space where you feel healthy, where you feel clear in your mind, where you feel powerful in your body. Um, I had a, a friend, I'm going to say friend, I don't know her name, and we, were, we went to this hot yoga class and it was like, you know, hot and doing the step. And I looked over and it was like, and they passed out. And the first thing that they said was, they were like literally like coming to and was like, I can't eat like that anymore. Because they realized that the body wasn't able to, um, to be able to maintain the level of requirement, that kind of level of requirement that, it would, that, that his mind was asking them to do if it's not being fueled in the proper way. So I would say get familiar with nutrition, get understanding about why fruits and vegetables are so important to our muscles, important for recovery, important. You have to understand you are now an athlete. A dancer is an athlete. And um, you, you need to just be mindful and love your body as though it is that thing. It is a machine and you need to make sure that it's getting what it needs to have. And then the idea of how you 
look will it'll form itself. So yes, and then there's conditioning. I grew up uh, in training of conditioning training, which is you know you are you know you're you're working your core, you're doing your your stretches. Stretches include to the point where you can put your foot on a chair and do your splits. Stretches include you know conditioning where you're holding your your back bend against the wall for a certain amount of time and you you begin to increase it. So it's a constant conditioning of stretching the capacity uh, uh, that that you have in your technique and um, and in uh, what your body what your body can do, how your body can look as far as when it's doing exercises and steps and stretching and that kind of stuff, not so much like this. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, good. I don't want anybody to be like, please, please, this whole dancer body thing and diet and all that stuff, because the whole point of the dance is for you to live in the fullness of yourself in the most beautiful, beautiful, beautiful expression. And how can you do that if you don't love the way you look? We grow, we're in the mirror all the time, right? So you need to begin to cultivate um, self-love for how your body looks. It was created like that for a reason. And I uh, don't try to starve it or diet it into looking a certain way. Try to serve it and give it what it needs to do what you're asking it to do. Um, I just have one other question. <laughs> have you ever uh, <laughs> have you ever experienced like any injuries and stuff? And if so, like how did you work past that and like not like want to give up? Yes. So I've had a, a lot. I grew up bad at shin splints, my knee, they thought they were gonna have to operate, but then I just did some therapy. Um, I was in a car accident a week before I did a um, concert, dance concert. I was a little bit on um, some pain medication, but I did it. That pushed through and then I, I tore my groin muscle and then a hamstring. I broke a toe, a pinky toe. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I've had some, some injuries and still danced. That's why I say you're an athlete. But one of the things that I remembered was that it's going to heal. So a lot of times people want to or feel like they, you know, there are some debilitating things that can happen. Right. But I'm, I'm big on process. So I'm big on on um, recuperation and then also therapy, like physical therapy that not maybe not someone else necessarily had me go through, but but pushing it to the point and laying off of it and then doing other things, learning how to compensate around like a torn, you know, hamstring and doing what I can until I can do what, what I really want to do, but being patient, but going through the process of re-strengthening whatever has happened. The body is incredible and amazing. And if you give it what it needs, it, it can heal, you know, and just remember that if, you know, as far as injuries are concerned, are you dealing with an injury or is it just a question? No, it's just a question. Okay. <laughs> In case those things happen. Yeah. It, it'll, 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 you know, usually it, it'll heal if, if you're willing to go through the process of, of uh, what it takes to heal it. So on this section, um, I know we're, uh, I'm looking at the time. And so, so I'm, I'm wondering, do you, do you have something prepared to ask them to present to them or, um, did you want to make that part of when you come back in the spring? What do you want to do at this point? It's up to you. Oh, um, I'm trying to think. Because, you know, we're going to do a mock audition um, yeah. with your second. Yeah. Like okay, so we can um, we can reserve that time for um, when you come back. In oh, the I do have a question just to know. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, um as everyone, I can't see everybody. I'm trying to, I'm going to try to put it where I can see more. But does everyone want to like dance professionally? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I think we do have some undecided, but there are, you know, there's definitely some in this group that do want to dance professionally. And then there's a few that are, you know, still on the fence, still making their decision. But the majority, the majority of them were nodding their heads. And yeah. Okay. And then, um, as far as the, the different routes, and this is just a matter of, it's not like you have to choose one or the other. 
because it can flow in and yeah. out. But there are some who are like, I want to be in a modern, I want to be in a dance company. I want to be commercial, you know, as far as film and television and, you know, tours and stuff. But as far as that's concerned, does anybody know, I want to do Broadway. I want to do a company. I want to do. No. Are you, can you see them? Because we have someone. I'm looking through. It won't let, because I'm spotlighted. So it's, it's flicking. Oh, I can off. take you off the spotlight. I can see them though. Yeah, okay. there we go. Okay. Okay, so she was just asking if, or do you know what specific lane there that you're interested in? Yeah. Okay. okay. And okay. so that's good to know just, just because as far as, like I always say it's good to, you know, be well-rounded and, and do all of it because you're just expanding the amount, of, the amount of times you get to perform and, and get paid for it. But um, specifically those that want to do Broadway, to make sure that you are doing some kind of vocal training. Doesn't mean that you are, you know, gonna sing the roof off, but that you are at a place where that's just another element because um, I did do a Broadway thing where Aida, I didn't end up going on the actual um, Broadway thing. I chose to stay in LA, but I went through the process of what it is to be a dancer on Broadway and to and to get a job on Broadway. And one of the things that they do have you do because they want you to be a part of the chorus is at least be able to have a song and sing it in front of people. And it doesn't mean that they're expecting you to do all the runs and all that kind of stuff, but at least be able to present, put some wind behind your words, which is what singing you know, ultimately is. And to be familiar doing that and to find, start to find a song or two that you feel comfortable with singing you know a few bars of to accompany your training specifically in in broadway and dance which is a little more storytelling dance than um than the other techniques and to begin to think about to think about that i was the only other question i wanted to know um so that um that doesn't sneak up on you yeah that's important yeah. Mrs. Moran. And yeah, I was going to say, if there's no other questions, we can, you know, kind of move to a close here. But just um, students, so that you know, we are having her back in the spring to do a mock audition with you, where you'll literally go through the process like a professional audition, you know, with the headshots, with the, you know, cast list, all of that. So you'll actually get callbacks and that kind of thing. So you'll really go through what it would be like, even though it won't, you know, it's not going to be hundreds of strangers, it'll just be your classmates, but you'll still get to feel what that's like to learn the choreography and have to do it in groups and get callbacks and that type of thing. Okay. Yeah, and what that process is for sure. Yeah. And then also I'm gonna touch a little bit too when you are dancing for uh, for the camera and mm -hmm. some, of the yeah. keep, some of the tidbits to keep in mind when that does happen um, and what you should be aware of and conscious of and the different takes and those kinds of things because it, when it comes into editing and how you want to present yourself and understand some of that camera one-on-one stuff. Yeah, that's super important. Yeah, I didn't even think about that aspect. I'm glad you brought that up. That will be, that's great, definitely useful. And this whole session, I mean, you're, you're you know, Fawn, you're really an amazing person and your story is amazing. And the things that you offer, um, the insight and also just the motivation are sincere. So I really, really, and, and I'm sure I can, I'm speaking on behalf of the, other, of the other teachers as well and, and the students, we really appreciate you taking this time um, to share with these kids because you don't know, and, and these young adults, because you don't know, you know, we don't know who is going to, you know, take off from here because of something that you said or something that they learned today. So um, just on behalf of everyone, I want to say thank you. And I know Dr. Woodard is here if she has something that she wants to say. Great. I am here and I'm, I'm glad you gave me the opportunity. I agree with what you just said, uh, Ms. Foster, about the depth, the breadth, the richness, Fawn, of your experience uh, in, in professional dance and how that is, how that can motivate and uh, deepen the students who are listening, their commitment to, to going into that direction. Because your story helps them realize that it, I can do that. I can do that. 
Listen, the one, one, one thing that kept resonating in my mind as you were talking that I want to say this and I want the kids to hear it too. If I could distill all of what Fawn said in just a few words, it would be this. And Misty Copeland said it too. There are no shortcuts. Mm -hmm. There are no shortcuts, girls, high school, middle school, uh, anything, anything that you're going to achieve, no matter what uh, aspect of life that is, and you're going to go for the gusto and try your hardest to be as great as you can be in that area, you, you have to work and you have to work continuously and diligently. I, I'm just, listen, I love art and I love dance and all of that. There was no way I could put in the time and the effort and the consistency that you talked about. I just have too many other things I want to do besides dance all day. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm just saying, kids, know this. It's, 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 it's not just a dream, that process. Yes. There are no shortcuts. That's the thing I'm going to say. And, you know, I go on too long with anything I say, so I'm going to cut it right there. Thank you, Fawn, and you thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Foster, uh, Ms. Moran, and Yakshan for putting this together and exposing our kids to that, to, to, to Fawn and all the other folks that uh, you guys have been successful at bringing to the kids. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure, such an honor. I'm looking forward to, to um, speaking with you all again and going through our other experiences and mm -hmm. um, just... Just thank you. Keep dancing and trust the process. It will take you where you want to go for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye. <laughs>